Our theme for today is inspiration and innovation, uh, both of which are typically born out of an unmet need. I work in the field of regenerative medicine, which is where we're trying to replace missing uh, or injured uh, body parts with functional tissue. So there's plenty of unmet needs. And I want to share with you what I think are, are three examples of innovation and inspiration that derived from this, uh, these unmet needs. And these have occurred over the past uh, 20 years or so. And uh, each of them represented uh, major steps forward, also accompanied by identification of limitations, which then supply, of course, the, the next unmet need or the innovation and inspiration that follows on. So what you're looking at uh, here is uh, a picture that maybe a lot of you have seen. It was published in the front of USA Today, I think, in 1993. Uh, it was a work of uh, uh, Langer and Vacanti at, uh, in Boston, and it's a human ear growing on the back of a mouse. And the idea was that this is uh, remarkable. We're going to be able to generate functional tissues outside of the body, and sometimes using uh, animal models, other times using culture and uh, petri dishes, uh, and then take it to the patient and be able to replace virtually any body part. And that this was about 1993, I said. So, however, uh, to, th to date, there's never been a single uh, person implanted with an ear that was manufactured in this way. And for that matter, uh, almost uh, there's very few examples of this particular approach resulting in uh, uh, replacement tissues. However, what, we, what it led to was say, why doesn't this work? So we identified a lot of uh, problems or limitations in uh, the way we culture cells. How do we get blood vessels in there? What about nerves? All of these things. Uh, so that was, the, that was the step back. The second major advancement uh, was the advent, really, uh, or the explosion of stem cell biology. You know, so in 19... Uh, 96, there was a publication on the culture of the human embryonic stem cell. About 10 years later, uh, we learned how to take a regular type cell, turn it into a stem cell, and not have to use embryonic stem cells. And the idea of what here was, we're going to be able to take an undifferentiated cell and solve all of the problems, because we can take this cell, turn it into a heart cell, turn it into a skin cell, turn it into a nerve cell, whatever we needed, we were going to be able to, to generate. and. Uh, to, to um, solve all of these problems in, in the field of regenerative medicine. So I went on to the um, uh, NIH uh, uh, clinicaltrials.gov website uh, about uh, la late last week, <clears throat> and I typed in stem cells clinical trials. You want to take a guess about how many uh, uh, trials are, are listed there? There's almost 3,000, over 2,800 active clinical stem cell trials. I was blown away. That is, a, that is an incredible amount of registry. That, those are just the registered trials. So you can imagine the amount of manpower that goes into that, the amount of resources, the dollars, the patients, you know, and, and the idea is, my gosh, this is fantastic, all of this, this work. And when I give uh, talks to groups of surgeons, typically, uh, you know, I, I'll quote the similar statistics, and the next question is, well, what patient walks in your door Every sing you know, that with any condition, any condition, no matter what your specialty is, then you routinely treat with stem cells because it's better than the standard of care. And room, room goes silent because there's, there's none. Well, does that mean that this isn't going to work? No, not at all. I mean, the, dial the biology that we've learned from all of the work going into stem cell biology has really set the stage for other ways of doing this. And so that, you know, there's a major step forward and then uh, uh, two, step, or two steps forward and one, one step back. Hopefully we're going that way. The idea is though we're always going uh, in the same direction, which is advancing, advancing the field. This next slide is what for uh, me and the people that work in my laboratory is basically the inspiration for us uh, literally every day. And what you're looking at is an image uh, taken by Bob Meacham at, uh, in St. Louis. And Bob's a matrix biology guy. And you're looking at the interface between the cell at the bottom and the extracellular matrix. Now, one of the limitations that we learned in the whole stem cell biology uh, field is when you identify these stem cells, and let's say you want to inject them into heart to replace the damaged tissue from a heart attack, 
The, the problem is the cells don't survive because you're putting them into an abnormal environment. Cells are very responsive to their microenvironment, the microenvironmental niche. And one of the things that uh, I've learned I is how incredibly smart Mother Nature is. You, one way to think about uh, the evolution is, the, the, is an R&D experience that's taken hundreds of millions of years to get to where we are. Well, this interface between the extracellular matrix and the cell, and by the way, the cell produces the extracellular matrix, uh, to be specific for whatever tissue and organ uh, we're looking at, uh, it is, that is the ideal uh, microenvironmental niche. It's Mother Nature's version of a microenvironmental niche. And if we understood everything about that matrix, we could synthesize it. If we understood the organization of each one of those fibers that are up there and all of the <clears throat> growth factors and signaling molecules that are, that are included in that, we would create that. But we, the problem is we don't. So what we do is isolate the extracellular matrix. And we remove the cells from a tissue or organ. And, and our uh, contribution is to provide a microenvironmental niche that's now going to allow what we've learned in the, in the stem cell explosion and in the, in the uh, experiments by individuals like uh, Langer and Bacani, how to hopefully allow those things to survive. So what I'm going to show you now is um, th this third example. One of the, one of the unmet medical needs and I'm, gonna, I'm looking in the audience here, I'm gonna bet about 25% of you have a gastric reflux. I've got gastric reflux. You know, and this is a, so we're all on you know, medications or sleeping with our heads elevated or whatever it takes to keep us from having heartburn. And uh, it is that it, it, what you do is change the microenvironment of the lining of the esophagus by having <clears throat> your stomach contents constantly uh, being refluxed back up into your esophagus. Well, the esophagus then says, well, if you're going to treat me like a stomach, I'm going to start to look like a stomach, and the transformation that occurs in the lining cells is not good. It's, it's a, on, a, on a progressive path to esophageal cancer, which uh, is the type of cancer that's increasing at a rate faster than any other type of cancer in the world. So working with some really uh, pioneering type uh, people, one of them being Dr. Blair Job at University of Pittsburgh, he developed a technique where we applied the principles we learned from the microenvironmental niche that's provided by the extracellular matrix to an abnormal environment in the esophagus. And using an endoscope goes down the esophagus and then takes uh, a, a tunneling technique and does, uh, makes an incision at the junction between the esophagus and the stomach through the lining, then comes upstream, does the same thing, and then goes back down and grabs the esophageal mucosa at the lining of the stomach uh, in, in, in the esophagus. And the video I'm going to show you is uh, that entire lining being removed from the esophagus of the second person that we, we tried this in. Now, the reason that this is not done clinically routinely is because everybody, quote, knows that you can't injure the, muc uh, the mucosa like that without en end, up, uh, end up with scarring. And in the esophagus, if you get scarring, you get stricture, the treatment's actually worse than the disease. So, so nobody does that. So what um, uh, Blair did was went and grabbed, this is like taking your sock off inside out. So this is uh, a patient who uh, had uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma. The lining was actually neoplastic already. It had not invaded below the lining. So the, we, we stripped the entire lining out of this uh, esophagus. Now, that's, that's a very dramatic, against the grain, outside the standard of care treatment for uh, this particular disease. And then we took a piece of extracellular matrix, and this happens to be from a pig, uh, the in small intestine of a pig. Cells are all removed. All we have is the microenvironmental niche. Wrap this around a balloon, run it up into the uh, denuded esophagus, blow it up, it wallpapers the inside of the denuded esophagus, and then it's held in place with a stent for a couple of days. And what you can see here is the transformation that occurs from on the upper left, the, the stripped esophagus, the stent in place, and then uh, when we took the stent out after two weeks, you can see we've actually disrupted the new lining, and then here's various times afterwards. Now, that, those pictures in the, on the lower uh, end of that, especially the last two, are entirely normal. You would never know 
that there was anything ever wrong with, with those. And if you look at the histology that goes with that on the top are the first five patients that we did that had a, a similar diagnosis, adenocarcinoma. The second row represents the remodeled or regrown normal <clears throat> esophageal uh, lining. So this was simply an approach where we did not use stem cells. We did not use any particular signaling molecules. What we tried to do was help Mother Nature out by providing an appropriate environment to say, it, the, the, here's, it's okay for every, all the cells that invade this acellular material to differentiate into a site-appropriate type of tissue. The best thing about it is this is, this is the patient, Mike, obviously on the right, Blair's on, the, on, on your left. Uh, this is the day after surgery. So he's, Mike is doing absolutely great. I just saw him about uh, eight months ago. He's put on 85 pounds. I said, hey, Mike, you know, this is not the reason we were fixing this. Thing. But, he, it, the, the, I, but he, absolutely normal. We've done about 14 patients now, and uh, none of them have had any recurrence of cancer. The longest survivors are, I think, 10, 10 years out. The least length of time is somewhere around two years or so forth. But this is not, we've, you know, I think here's a, another advancement. But now what are the limitations? How, can, how broadly can we apply this type of a technology? You know, how do you prepare this? What are the limits and so forth? So the, idea, the whole idea here is that we, we learn from our mistakes. This is not an easy uh, task, but it's fun. Uh, and it's inevitable. Uh, and this is the way we're going to continue to uh, move forward, uh, be inspired by our limitations, by the mistakes of others. And we make plenty of mistakes. Uh, and go forward. Now, I'm not sure if anyone in this room wants to live to be 120 or whatever. The whole idea of regenerative medicine is not to make us live forever. It's quality uh, over quantity. And I, I'm going to leave you with that thought. Thank you very much.